an eagle in the sky. More books, more magazine articles, and even more poems have been written about air combat than about any other aspect of aviation. Why? Well, it's the most exciting kind of flying and one of the greatest challenges for any human being. It's also graceful and in a way beautiful. It has a history of noble chivalry and of individual combat like the knights of a bygone era. But it's also deadly serious. There's not much point in coming a good second. Here then is the world of the fighter, of dogfights, of air-to-air -air missiles, and of high-speed combat. Eagle one, check six. You have a bandit coming in from the south. One, break down and left. Bandit, you're six. Eagle two, engaged in the F5, coming off Eagle one. Eagle two, Next shot at five, right hand trip. In World War II, there were many eagles in the sky. This P-51 Mustang was one of more than 15,000 basically similar aircraft. It had the longest range of any single engine fighter of its day, and it conquered the skies over the heart of Nazi Germany. From the P-51, North American aviation developed two stretched Mustang fuselages joined together with a common wing and horizontal tail. The original idea was that it should escort B-29s on the long missions to Japan. The two pilots could share the flying and thus ease the problems of fatigue. In the event, the twin Mustang missed World War II but saw action in Korea as a night fighter. There, one of the pilots was replaced by a radar operator. The F-86 Sabre was the first Western fighter with swept back wings and tail. It was one of the greatest air combat aircraft of all time, and it alone could meet the Soviet-built MiG-15 in Korea on level terms. Not only was it superbly maneuverable and very strong, but by pulling around into quite a brief dive, it was possible for the Sabre to exceed the speed of sound. The Eagles were getting more complex and pilots had a lot more to learn. The next generation jet fighter was the F-100 Super Sabre. Thanks to a mighty afterburning engine which could blast out a thunderous flame at the rear, the F-100 could fly faster than sound in level flight. These were early days for supersonic flying, over 30 years ago, and the F-100 was not quite as good a dogfighter as its predecessor. But it equipped the U.S. Air Force Thunderbirds display team, and their noise, smoke, flame, and tight formations were something new and exciting. In Vietnam, the Super Sabres flew many different kinds of missions. Great Britain was slow getting into supersonic fighters, but by 1959 was producing a fighter that could fly at twice the speed of sound. The Lightning had a radar in the nose for intercepting hostile airplanes in all weather. On takeoff, the nose could be pulled up almost vertically and the altimeter could unwind faster than ever before and go on to 50,000 feet altitude.
Even at Mach 2, the Lightning could roll rapidly and pull around in a hard turn. The pilot became the limiting factor, but it was one of the most popular fighters ever, and its maneuverability was exceptional. The wing was swept back at the acute angle of 60 degrees. At the back were two engines, uniquely arranged one above the other. For the first time, here was a fighter whose engine thrust could be about the same as the aircraft's weight. Lightning's short endurance could be extended by plugging into a tanker, such as a four-jet Valiant, and topping up the fighter's tanks. Lightning pioneered the concept of hot ass. Hands on throttle and stick, each hand having different switches and buttons under each finger or thumb. These could be used to obtain the target on radar, decide the best moment to attack, and lock on to infrared emissions from the enemy's engines. Hot ass enabled one man to operate the radar and also manage fire streak or red top guided missiles, packs of rockets or twin 30 millimeter guns. hit with a missile would destroy most aircraft. At low speeds in the airfield circuit, and low meant maybe 300 knots, the Lightning was an absolute joy to fly. The 74 Squadron, based at Coltishall, became the first operational Royal Air Force Lightning Unit. At the Farnborough Air Show, they put on an impressive display at full squadron strength. When the Lightning entered service almost 30 years ago, the McDonnell Aircraft Company in St. Louis was flight testing the first F-4 Phantom IIs. It had two advanced J-79 engines with variable inlets and variable nozzles. Designed as a carrier-based interceptor for the Navy, the Phantom proved to be an aircraft of extraordinary capability. It 
had a crew of two, the backseater having charge of the extremely powerful radar. Structurally, it was almost unbreakable. The internal fuel capacity was tremendous, and in any case, the mission could be extended by air refueling. The early F-4B version was equipped for catapult launches and arrested landings, and normally carried four big radar-guided Sparrow missiles and four close-range Sidewinder missiles. Perhaps above all, the Phantom could carry a mighty and varied load of weapons, fitting it for almost every kind of fighter mission. The Air Force was so impressed it adopted this Navy airplane and equipped tactical wings with the F-4C and then with the F-4D, in which the equipment was specially selected for land-based operations, including ground attack with bombs, rockets, and smart precision weapons. In Vietnam, the F-4 was unquestionably the number one warplane. The Big Sparrows downed many hostile aircraft. Sometimes a cannon pod was carried externally, and at close range, the gun was often lethal, even against such an agile target as the MiG-17. As the conflict in Southeast Asia dragged on, the Phantom replaced older aircraft types, and towards the end of the war, the upgraded F-4E introduced a slatted wing and an internal gun. It was by far the greatest fighter of its era. In contrast, Sweden can never hope to build fighters in great quantities, but it builds very good ones and has had no failures. The latest type in service is the Saab Viggen, or System 37. The Viggen has a big wing and a flapped canard foreplane, partly for combat maneuverability and partly to give it a very short takeoff and landing. Unlike some countries, the Swedes know that should its air force ever have to go to war, nothing parked on a regular airfield is likely to survive. So they design their fighters to operate from country roads and other dispersed and hidden locations. The JA-37 fighter version can carry four Sky Flash missiles, probably the best radar-guided missile currently in service, and Sidewinders. There is also a powerful gun. Using the advanced multi-mode radar display, Swedish pilots have total confidence that their Sky Flash missiles will find their targets. The landing is shortened by slamming onto the ground without the usual flare and hold off, and then putting the huge engine into reverse thrust. In France, the latest fighter in service is the Mirage 2000. Though it looks very much like the Mirage 3 of over 30 years ago, the 2000 is a completely new fighter. For long-range interception, Mirage 2000 carries the Super 530 or 530D radar-guided missiles. The Mirage 2000 features the modern style of unstable design which enhances maneuverability. This is made possible by a fly-by-wire or electrically signaled control system incorporating lightning-fast computers. Unlike earlier Mirages, 
The delta-shaped triangular wing has powerful leading edge slats, which in combat can be used in conjunction with the main trailing edge elevons to increase wing camber or curvature. This greatly improves turn radius without suffering the rapid fall off in speed of earlier mirages. For close in dogfighting, the magic infrared homing missile can be used. Two internal 30 millimeter guns are also fitted. Though it can carry ordnance for ground attack missions, the Mirage 2000C, the version initially put into service, is first and foremost an air combat fighter. In 1988, most of the aircraft in service were fitted with an uprated radar of the modern pulse Doppler type, which will improve the ability of this Mach 2.2 fighter to intercept its enemies. Like the Mirage family, the Northrop F-5 was originally designed in the 1950s. Its combination of good performance and very low costs led to sales of over 2,600 aircraft. It is a most agile and elusive lightweight fighter and is quite at home over deserts, mountains or jungles. The original design was the F-5AB Freedom Fighter. A later development was the F-5EF Tiger II. F-5's combat range can be extended by in-flight refueling. F-5s serve with air forces on every continent in the world. As an export fighter, the F-5 was not intended for the U.S. Air Force or Navy, but in the event, both services have bought the F-5E and two-seat F-5F to serve in the aggressor role. Painted in special camouflage schemes to make them look like aircraft of the Soviet Union and other Warsaw Pact forces, they act the part of the enemy in what is called dissimilar air combat training. At Air Force bases, such as Nellis, Nevada, and Alkenbury in England, as well as at the Naval Air Stations, Oceana in Virginia, and the Top Gun School at Miramar in California, F-5s prepare every day to take off and act the role of the enemy. Flown to the limits, the agile F-5s 
provide a frighteningly realistic threat. The Navy and Marines also use the Israeli Kafir and the F-16N in similar aggressor roles. Flown by the best fighter instructors, well-versed in Soviet tactics, the aggressors teach America's young combat pilots how to fight and how to win. Each aggressor mission is preceded by a detailed briefing. These instructors will teach their opponents that they have to use their brains, their eyes, and pretty well all their fingers and toes. To beat them, you simply have to be good. And repeated workouts like these flown against Air Force Eagles hone the pilot's abilities razor sharp. Eagle 1, check 6, the other bandit coming in from the south. 1, break down and left, bandit, you're 6. Eagle 2, engage in the F5, coming off Eagle 1. Eagle 1, check 6, the other bandit coming in from the south. Next shot, at 5 right hand trip. Nickel 1, bandit, 0, 1, 0, 10 miles, southbound. Nickel 1, looking no joint. Nickel 2 is tally, right, 1 low. Execute. Okay, one coming back in. I'm engaged at uh, 50 GMB, the other one's two feet north of me. Hard to visit. Five. Two coming left, the other bandit's going to left turn at 15,000. One, Roger, pressure here. Mine's trying to take it down. I got everybody first. Nickel two, you got two fights going up, and I'm going for guns. Snapshot, F5, right turn. Two, come off left. My man's coming up after you. Are you two coming left? He's still coming after you. One's right behind him. Second kill, F5, right turn. Nickel 2 is engaged. He's trying to run. Fox 2 kill. 1, Roger, they're both dead. Nickel 1, knock it off. Nickel 2, knock it off. Aggressors will always be here. It was an idea, and it's a beautiful idea. Roger, Eagle 1, knock it off. Eagle 2, knock it off. GCI copies, knock it off. After each engagement, the pilots are soaked with sweat. Later, they'll rerun the whole thing using computer tapes and video displays. Of all modern fighters, the General Dynamics F-16 Fighting Falcon most completely typifies the pure air combat aircraft. Experience in the Vietnam War showed that huge, complex fighters might not be the best answer for engaging agile enemies in close combat. A lightweight fighter competition was held, and the F-16, with its advanced avionics, won. The all-round view from its unobstructed bubble canopy was almost perfect. The pilot lay back in an inclined seat, so high that most of him was inside the canopy. In front were advanced displays. On the left, the throttle to unleash mighty power, and on the right, a miniature stick. The pilot flies with his right arm resting on the cockpit side panel. The tiny stick hardly moves, but senses the forces imparted by the pilot's hand. The output signals command the F-16. Never before could a fighter pull a 9G turn and still less sustain such a bone-crushing turn indefinitely. As in all modern fighters, the pilot has an advanced head-up display and colorful head-down displays, which he can reprogram at the touch of particular buttons. 
powered by an F-100 augmented turbofan engine, the same engine as used in the big twin-engined F-15, the F-16 has abundant power for quick takeoff and steep climb or instant maneuvers. Originally, the air combat weapons were limited to sidewinders and a gun inside the left wing route. Today, the F-16C can fire the advanced AMRAAM missile. A single hit with such a missile can easily destroy a QF-102 target. To protect itself, the F-16 can dispense chaff to confuse enemy radars. If attacked by heat-seeking missiles, it can decoy them away by releasing bright flares. Hill Air Force Base, Utah, was selected to become the launch pad for the Fighting Falcon. Not only was this base the home of the first F-16 combat unit, but it has also trained pilots and engineers from almost every one of the many foreign customers, including the four major NATO European Air Forces, who helped launch the program. The Falcon entered service at Hill in the first week of 1979, five months after its maiden flight. It was then still a very new aircraft, and Hill not only explored its reliability and maintainability under service conditions, but also kept discovering new capabilities. Hill gets all kinds of weather, from scorching summer heat to arctic conditions in winter, and the first unit, the USAF 388th Tactical Fighter Wing, subjected the new aircraft to a grueling series of intensive operations, finally becoming fully combat ready in October 1980. Throughout, the F-16's performance was brilliant. First overseas customers were the four European NATO Air Forces, Belgium, Denmark, the Netherlands, and Norway. All four countries shared in the manufacturing program, with F-16 assembly lines in Belgium and the Netherlands, from which have come well over 400 aircraft. Norway's aircraft tend to operate for much of the year in icy conditions. also are equipped with braking parachutes in the extended compartment immediately below the rudder. All F-16s are fitted with comprehensive electronics and targeting equipment. In the presence of many dignitaries from the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the Belgian 349th Squadron became the first F-16 unit to be declared to NATO as fully operational at Bovisan Air Base on 16th January 1981. In becoming operational, this unit put up the best scores in air-to-air -air and air-to-surface firing ever attained at the ranges at Solenzara in Corsica, figures subsequently bettered by other F-16 units as they entered service. Belgian F-16s appear similar to those of the Norwegian Air Force, with the prominent extension above the jet nozzle, but in place of a parachute, the compartment houses electronic countermeasures equipment. As early as July 1979, the USAF's 16th Tactical Fighter Training Squadron began taking on board Belgian and Dutch aircraft to help train foreign F-16 pilots. 
In Denmark, one main F-16 operating base is at Skurdstrup, the other being at Arlberg. Like other operators of the Fighting Falcon, the Danes reckon to fly three sorties per day per aircraft, something unheard of with some earlier jets. Full maintenance and testing facilities are of course available to keep the aircraft flying. In numerical terms, the most powerful European F-16 force is that of the Netherlands. With the Dutch, the accent is on the air-to-ground mission, and they have found that even the original F-16A can set outstanding scores in bombing and air-to-ground gunnery, despite the fact that Dutch weather is often very bad. Most F-16A customers are participating in various staged improvement plans for upgrading avionics and weapons capability. However, the basic aircraft starts off with an unrivaled combination of reliability and agility. In particular, the combination of a sustained 9G turn reckoned to be a unique capability, though the MiG-29 may come somewhere near this, coupled with the world's best all-round vision from the cockpit, makes the F-16 the fighter every pilot would love to fly. New options include an improved F-100 engine or the outstanding General Electric F-110 engine. This gives considerably greater thrust than the F-100 and totally eliminates all restrictions on engine handling even in seemingly impossible flight attitudes. In Europe, the cost of modern combat aircraft has forced friendly nations to collaborate. The largest program of all is for the Tornado. Originally built for Britain, West Germany and Italy, it has since been sold to several other countries. Based on the world's best low-level attack aircraft, the ADV, air defense variant, is a long-range all-weather interceptor. The compact RB199 engines provide high thrust with minimal fuel consumption for long range and endurance. The ADV is now in service with the Royal Air Force and new squadrons are forming. This variant has also been sold to the Air Force of Saudi Arabia. The pivoted swing wings have sweep angle automatically varied for optimum combat agility, backed up by an auto maneuver device system. All tornadoes are designed to sustain operations with minimum ground support. An inbuilt gas turbine auxiliary unit provides power on the ground for every purpose, including starting main engine. The engines have built-in thrust reversers to stop the aircraft quickly after landing without need for a drag chute. Either engine can be changed and replaced by three men in less than one hour. Almost half the external surface of Tornado is made up of quick access doors and panels, none of which need special tools to open or close. All the dozens of black boxes of avionics are plug-in units. They can be replaced quickly with no on-aircraft calibration.
Most units are self-testing and their serviceability can be checked at a glance on a central maintenance panel. Any fault can be easily located. A ground test program can be loaded into the aircraft's main computer and full details read out from one of the cockpit displays. To refuel, you merely set the amount required and the system will cut off at that level. In the air, the tornado can extend its retractable flight refueling probe and plug into a tanker. Fuel can even be accepted from another tornado operating in the buddy tanker role. The navigation accuracy of tornado is legendary. This is handled by the back seat member of the crew. In the strike tornado, he faces three main electronic displays. One on the left can be in the navigation format. The other on the right is in the mission planning format. In the center is a moving map display. The central display can also have a detailed radar picture superimposed on it, giving a precise picture of aircraft position. The Tornado F3 interceptor version also has a weapon system officer in the back seat. All his displays can be programmed into various formats, depending on the mission and the tasks. However, these displays are modified to enable him to manage the AI-24 Fox Hunter interception radar. Fox Hunter can detect targets at long range, track while scanning for fresh targets, and operate in severe electronic warfare conditions. The display can show radar data in various formats such as target detection and target tracking, with heading, height, and speed of the enemy shown. High resolution radar mapping is also available for accurate navigation. Tornado ADV's principal weapons comprise the Sky Flash and Sidewinder missiles usually four of each, and a gun. To accommodate the Sky Flash missiles in tandem, the fuselage was lengthened, and this has had the effect of providing room for 10% more fuel, giving extended range or longer time on station during combat air patrols. To ensure clean missile separation under all conditions, the big Sky Flash missiles are positively thrust down and clear of the aircraft by cartridge-powered ejectors. Altogether, the Royal Air Force believes the Tornado F3 is the most potent all-weather interceptor in production. It also feels that it is the only aircraft able to meet its need for defense in all weather of the huge volume of sky that is the RAF's responsibility. This covers Britain's own airspace, the North Sea, and extends west to Iceland and north to the Arctic. What is the most capable all-round fighter in the world? Some people would consider the U.S. Navy's F-14 Tomcat had a good claim, even though it entered service as long ago as 1972. 
F-14 squadrons of the Atlantic Fleet are progressively rotated through Oceana, Virginia for combat training with Fighter Squadron 43, the Challengers. This Navy outfit uses a variety of aircraft, including the F-5, T-38 Talon, and specially equipped TA-4J Skyhawks to provide dissimilar air combat training comparable to that given to the Air Force by its aggressor squadrons. Here, Tomcat pilots are briefed for their mission over the range. Their role, flying from a simulated carrier, is to provide air defense against an attack by hostiles from Squadron 43, in this case, four F-5s. The job of the Challengers is to move down the corridor, penetrate the air defense screen, and sink the carrier. The job of the F-14s is to stop them. Weather, communications, weapons, and the extent of hostile penetration are all taken into account to determine the F-14's tactics. And at the Challenger's briefing... Commander Fultz, four versus the Jollies, we can count on them having four up jets, up radars, and aggressive tactics. Our experience with them has been that they come to fight. Let's go for it. Squadron 43 tangles with the other Navy airplanes over the Atlantic. The entire airspace, as well as the aircraft themselves, is electronically instrumented to form an air combat maneuvering range. This enables every engagement to be recreated electronically so that it can be played back afterwards and analyzed in detail. This eliminates arguments and permits the pilots to see where errors, if any, have been made. It also enables new tactics to be developed. All members of the F-14 unit are put through their paces, from the newest ensign to the squadron commander. You got into uh, lethal range. I knew that I was dead once I picked you up. Walter called me back, and by then it was too late. 
temptation was to try to come up into the fight, but we stayed overhead the ship, according to the game plan. The Navy's F-14 Tomcat, brought to fitness by its sparring partners of units like 43 Squadron, is the supreme heavyweight champion of world carrier aircraft. While the Navy was putting the F-14 into service, the Air Force was busy readying the F-15 Eagle. Developed by McDonnell Douglas at St. Louis, the F-15 is considered by many to be the greatest fighter ever. Two F-100 turbofan engines give a takeoff thrust of around 25 tons, which is more than the clean gross weight. As a result, the performance is spectacular. As soon as the wheels leave the ground, you can haul back on the stick and point the nose straight up. Within three or four seconds, the rate of climb can exceed 50,000 feet per minute. The F-15's wing is crucial to its maneuverability, and it gets its power mainly by being very large. Wing area exceeds 600 square feet, which is about the size of a medium bomber's wing in World War II, and three times as big as a typical World War II fighter. The wing's lifting power is so great that the latest version, the F-15E, can carry not only a huge load of fuel, but also a bomb load of over 23,500 pounds. The maximum loaded weight of the F-15E version is 81,000 pounds, which is heavier than any World War II heavy bomber and 10 times as heavy as a typical World War II fighter. Despite this, the F-15 has fantastic flight performance with a top speed two and a half times the speed of sound. Unfortunately, it also needs extremely strong and level paved runways. And the Air Force has belatedly begun to wonder how it can keep its F-15s flying if their big and vulnerable bases should be destroyed by enemy air or missile strikes. Often, and especially in Europe, NBC exercises are mounted in which all personnel wear the uncomfortable protective clothing intended to enable operations to continue in nuclear, biological, or chemically contaminated environments. NBC exercises, though vital, are seldom popular, especially on a hot and humid day. Even when wearing the protective clothing, all personnel have to be able to carry out their allotted tasks both outside on the airfield and also within hardened aircraft shelters. Once the shelter doors are closed, the aircraft can be repaired, refueled and rearmed, ready for another mission. All NATO airfields are being equipped with similar blast-proof shelters. Regular deployment to Europe of F-15 units, normally stationed in the U.S., such as these from the 1st Tactical Fighter Wing at Langley, Virginia, enable both pilots and ground crews to familiarize themselves with the problems of operating from frontline air bases. Though the aircraft handling techniques may be similar, there is an added sense of danger. It is also particularly important in the event of a scramble to get as many aircraft into the air as fast as possible so that they are not caught on the ground by an enemy's preemptive strike. At the 57th Fighter Interceptor Squadron at Keflavik, Iceland, for example, 
there is never a shortage of genuine Soviet airplanes who approach to test the West's defenses. At this and many other Eagle bases in the States and around the world, the pilots and highly skilled ground personnel get on with the never-ending task of keeping 1,000 U.S. Air Force Eagles in the top line and ready to go. On the warning of approaching hostiles, the reaction is always an immediate scramble. While ground staff ready the airplanes, the pilots slide down poles like firemen into the readiness hangar. There they try to save precious seconds as they don flying clothing and climb up to the lofty cockpit. The access ladder is removed, harness is adjusted, bone dome pulled on and the canopy closed. The ground crew makes its final checks and the chalks are pulled away. Between three and five minutes after the first call to scramble, the section slated for the mission is taxiing up. Then comes the thunderous surge of power as the engines go into full afterburner. And within a few more seconds, White vapor is streaming back from the wingtips as the eagles pull up to high altitude. The eagle was developed to counter the Soviet Union's MiG-25 Foxbat. But unlike the Soviet aircraft, the F-15 was, from the start, planned as an agile dogfighter. At the same time, it has great range, all-weather capability, and a standoff kill ability using radar-guided Sparrow air-to-air -air missiles. Like other Air Force fighters, the F-15 needs plenty of fuel. The internal fuselage tanks can hold over 2,000 U.S. gallons. A further 1,500 gallons can be accommodated in conformal pallets called fast packs on the sides of the fuselage. A further 1,830 gallons can be carried in three streamlined drop tanks. If this isn't enough, it is possible to formate behind a tanker and be topped up in the sky. Sometimes the tanker is a Boeing KC-135. Sometimes it is a monster McDonnell Douglas KC-10. Like most Air Force warplanes, the F-15 is equipped for air refueling through a rigid boom aimed by an operator aboard the tanker. After the mission, the Eagles return home for a rapid turnaround, ready to go again. Back at base, for example at Bitburg in Germany, there are a thousand tasks to be done by teams of skilled people working together to prepare the Eagles for another sortie. The job? To get their aircraft back in the air as fast as possible. Systems must be checked. Repairs must be made. Fast packs have to be removed or installed. The hectic work continues, yet no detail can be overlooked. Records are kept and base security is maintained. Fuel connections are made, countless onboard systems checked and sometimes refurbished. Fuel tanks are refilled, the guns prepared for loading and engines maintained.
Meanwhile, the pilots are briefed and tasked for new missions. Perhaps an engine has to be changed or the giant speed brake checked over. Sidewinder missiles are prepared. The delta wings are clipped onto the big sparrow missiles. All the air-to-air -air missiles, which are the Eagle's talons, are ready. 940 rounds of 20 millimeter ammo are loaded. The pilots don their equipment and return once more to their aircraft. Final ground crew checks are made. The chocks are kicked away and another F-15 sortie begins with a 100% serviceable airplane. The Eagles are ready to fly and fight again. Back in the sky, the F-15 pilot is once more working under great pressure to watch his displays, hands on throttle and stick, to defeat his enemies. An F-4 ought to be no problem, fine fighter though it is. The nimble little F-5 may be a little harder, but any competent F-15 jockey can soon get the pipper on the target. In real action, the target could be engaged with guns, or at rather greater ranges, by a sidewinder. If a sparrow is selected, the enemy may possibly be engaged at a range of 50 miles or more. Actual firing of missiles is not very common, and the fighter pilot seldom sees a close-up view of the effect of his missile. The usual target for live firings is a QF-102, itself once a proud all-weather interceptor, but now built as a remotely piloted target for newer fighters to shoot out of the sky. Sometime in the 21st century, the F-15 Eagles will, in their turn, be gradually consumed by the missiles fired in practice from such totally new fighters as the F-22 or the F-23 Advanced Tactical Fighter. But today, they are proud eagles in the sky, able to defeat all enemies. <laughs>